Thanks for that um, really kind introduction, Liliana. It's been very fun visiting the department today and seeing some uh, old friends and, and meeting some new people. So I have this incredibly general talk um, that's sort of a talk title that sort of combines a lot of different topics. Hopefully through the course of my talk today, um, what I mean by this will become a little bit more clear. Um, so most of my lab uh, focuses on non-human primates. So I'll go ahead and start just by introducing um, one of the systems that we focus on most intensively. These are yellow baboons um, in the Amboseli Basin of Kenya, so near the border between Kenya and Tanzania to the south. Um, I like to show this picture uh, taken by um, one of my collaborators, former graduate students, because it's a particularly striking picture, but also because it gives you a little bit of a snapshot of the ecology of these animals. So um, this is a, a fever tree, an acacia tree. This is an important resource for them as a sleeping site, and they also use it as a food resource um, when it fruits, when it flowers. They also uh, use the gum. This is a typical you know, East African savanna grassland, perhaps not so dissimilar from the types of environments that some of our ancestors evolved in. Again, one of the major food resources for these animals, especially in the dry season when this picture was taken. In fact, although it looks like there are a lot of threatening clouds in the back, um, this is during a time when it's almost certain uh, never to rain. So um, dealing with the fluctuations in temperature and rainfall and the day-to-day the -day efforts of making a living, of finding food in this environment, um, are some of the challenges that these animals face from day to day. Um, but what really grabs our attention, the real focus of much of our research, has to do with what we think is the primary determinant of whether or not a baboon has a good day or has a bad day. And it's actually not so dissimilar from the primary determinants of whether we have a good day or a bad day. And that has to do with interactions with other members of their own species. Both competitive interactions, so these are some males engaging in a little bit of a non-contact dominance encounter up here on the right, and affiliative interactions, um, socially supportive interactions, friendly interactions like um, shown in this picture here on the left. And of course, both um, competitive and affiliative interactions have been of interest to primate researchers for a long time. I think actually one of the most interesting um, uh, strains uh, of work to come out of uh, not only the primate literature but the social mammal literature in the last 10 years is actually how important these interactions in particular are to determining um, the survival and lifespans of animals like these. Now um, this is, as I said, relevant to our own species as well. And if you start dipping into uh, the literature on humans, you realize that all the literature on affiliative interactions in humans, especially re as related to uh, mortality and survival, you know, this fundamental component of Darwinian fitness, we're, we're so far behind what's been done um, on human populations. Simply to illustrate this, this is from a meta-analysis of 148 studies that were done on healthy human populations with a total sample size of about 300,000 individuals. Um, this is just a summary that shows the relative relationship between mortality risk and the predictor on the left-hand side for each of these five predictors. The top two are about social affiliation integration. The bottom three are about some things that we think of as normal risk factors for mortality in our own species, like smoking behavior, drinking to excess, past history, or a history of cardiovascular disease. And so the upshot here is that there's very robust evidence now in humans that um, social relationships and social integration have as strong or stronger a predictive effect on all-cause mortality, excluding suicide, than um, you know, these kinds of risk factors down here. In fact, it increases, social isolation increases mortality risk by about 50% for both sexes and across all adult ages. Okay, similarly, you know, we've been studying social status. That's the outcome of, social of competitive social interactions in species like this. Again, the data sets in humans just you know, make you wanna go home and take a nap. This was published just this last year in, uh, um, in JAMA. And this data set is uh, 1.4 billion person years of data. In fact, some of you in this room are probably in this data set. You just don't know it. So this is from, um, this is about mortality in the United States population from 1999 to 2014. If you have a social security number and you paid taxes, and you were above 40 anywhere in that window from 1999 uh, up to 2014, you're in this data set. This data set, shows us the relationship between one measure of socioeconomic status, 
social status in humans. That's just uh, income, household income at age 40, and expected lifespan. And the, the remarkable um, result is that the difference in expected lifespan from being at the top or the bottom um, of that particular social status hierarchy is from 10 to 15 years of difference in expected adult lifespan. So these are extremely powerful data sets. You actually don't need a data set quite that big to show effect sizes quite that large. Um, but they're, they're mostly gathered by, by social scientists. And, and that leaves, I think, a lot of room for us to use our studies in non-human animal models to ask some more fundamental questions about why these kinds of effects have evolved and how deeply they might uh, be rooted in our evolutionary history. Uh, we use um, uh, the wild baboon system to get at some questions like that. And they also leave a lot of open questions about the actual mechanisms that relate social interactions on one hand to um, uh, what in the human literature would be called health outcomes, which I, what I think in the non-human primate, no, in social mammal literature at least, we would call fitness-associated um, traits. Okay, and for that, we um, do experimental work in, in captive rhesus macaques. Okay. So I'll talk about the baboon work first. Um, as, I, as I introduced earlier, the focus of my work on baboons is in the Ambicelli Basin, um, where a wild population of yellow baboons has been subject to continuous study um, since 1971. This is my first talk of 2017, so I can now say we are in our 46th year of continuous data collection, um, meaning actually really every day um, other than Sundays. Um, this, was, uh, w uh, this is a project that I'm very fortunate to be um, associated with. It was started back in 1971 um, by Jean and Stuart Altman. Um, and I co-direct it today with, with Jean, Susan Alberts, who's also at Duke, and Beth Archie, who's at University of Notre Dame. And so what this gives us access to is a lot of multidimensional data, um, including demographic information, behavioral information more recently, um, endocrinological, parasitological, and genetic and genomic uh, data, which I'm not going to actually talk about today with respect to the baboons. Okay. What do, we, what do we do with that information? Well, um, historically, what we've done are lots of studies of single or a few predictor variables and their outcomes. You know, how do affiliative social interactions influence um, survival? How do those interactions influence um, the gut microbiome? What kinds of differences in um, ecology from year to year or season to season are predictive of fertility-related traits or, or survival-related traits? Um, what explains variation in dominance rank, and so on. So what that's given us um, over the last few decades is an idea of the types of environmental and social influences that we think are really important for the animals that we study. And um, as, you, as you might be able to tell from the examples um, I brought up at the beginning, we spent a lot of time talking to people who study humans. And um, we uh, learned that one of the common ways to ask about long-term effects over the life history on survival is actually to uh, just combine all those individual predictor variables that one thinks might be important and ask in aggregate how they might influence survival. So that's what we did. Um, we <laughs> there was some resistance to this initially because it felt very non-biological. But what we did was say, OK, we have six things that we think are really important to the lives of baboons when, um, when they're um, uh, early in life. One is their, their social status, their dominance rank, which is largely determined by um, who they're born to, so their mother's place in a social status hierarchy, which is um, quite um, strongly enforced in this species and, and linear. Uh, whether or not their moms um, were around throughout their uh, maturational period, so before those females um, hit menarche. Um, I'm focusing on females here, sorry, I should have mentioned that. The quality of the environment um, in the year they were born, was it a drought year? This is an ecosystem that's pretty prone to, to um, low rainfall years. How much competition they were experiencing, again, from conspecific, so how large, effectively, was the group that they were born in? Were their mothers socially isolated or not? I alluded to earlier um, uh, some, some results that show that socially isolated individuals um, have shorter lifespans, while their offspring also seem to have shorter lifespans, um, at least in, in some other baboon populations that have been looked at. 
And uh, finally, whether they were faced with direct competition for maternal resources from a competing younger sibling. So was there another infant born to their mother within about a year and a half of their birth? That's the shortest inner birth, shortest quartile of inner birth ranges that we see in our population. Okay. So all we did was take these six different things. They're, they're largely uncorrelated with one another. So an individual who um, is born in a drought is not more likely to be um, born to a socially isolated mother and ask how many of these sources of adversity affected the lifespan of a young female baboon. And I'm jumping straight to the results here. So this is um, um, a plot showing the proportion of animals still surviving at a given age for animals who had none of those things happen to them, those are in the dark blue line, um, versus those who have one, two, or three. This is a, a, a really big effect size on survival. It says the expected lifespan for animals who have different levels of early life social adversity is actually, um, um, well, huge. I can show you that for females, this is adult survival, who lived to adulthood, the ex median expected lifespan um, was 18 and a half years across this whole data set. For uh, those who had uh, three or more bad things happen to them, their expected adult lifespan was just under nine years. So we're talking about differences on the order of a decade. Just to scale that to human lifespans, um, our life histories progress at about a third of the pace of a baboon. So we're talking about something that would be analogous to a 30-year difference in, in lifespan. This is the sort of thing, I think I said this to someone earlier today, where um, we were sort of gobsmacked that we'd never noticed this. Um, but we had to actually put together the data in this way to see it. Okay, um, just to link this back to my comments about social connectedness, it also turns out that females who had more bad things happen to them um, also tended to be more socially isolated as adults. And we don't know why that is, but um, it may be one of the mediating factors. Okay, again, um, people who study human populations have described these kinds of phenomena for a long time, and actually early life effects are well described across a number of different species. These are some particularly um, famous study systems, especially the Dutch hunger winter, in which uh, early life adversity reduced caloric intake, for example, or sometimes aspects of social adversity, especially in an ongoing prospective study going on um, at Princeton right now, um, has been linked to later life um, uh, disease burden and, and, and to lifespan. Uh, the usual interpretation when researchers working on these populations, on most of these populations, um, want to interpret what's going on here in the light of evolution, um, the argument often relies on this concept of, of mismatch, that, uh, that individuals are gestating and born in a particular environment and their physiology is adjusted such that they will be better able to cope with an environment that is sort of similarly shaped in adulthood if they face an environment that's actually quite different from that early life environment then um, they suffer you know uh, health health costs okay so um, we think that 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 hypothesis is interesting but it hasn't actually been adequately tested in most of the human populations in which it's talked about the most. And this was a, a, a particular interest of my graduate student, Amanda Lea. So we can formalize the stuff that I just kind of verbally said in terms of reaction norms. Okay? So the hypothesis that I just told you about is sometimes referred to as early life programming, sometimes referred to as a predictive adaptive response. And it basically says that there should be crossing reaction norms. So you have individuals who were born in a poor earlier environment and individuals who are born in a benign early life environment. And if their um, adult environments match those early environments, they do well. And if they, if they don't, they do poorly. So, th so there's a relative switch in um, measures of fitness under this hypothesis depending on the combination of early and adult environments and inter interaction effects. Alternatively, um, a typical model is something that focuses on constraints on development, that actually being exposed to a poor quality early environment simply is a limit on optimal development. And so those reaction norms might look something like this. Instead, instead of crossing, um, those who are born in benign early environments just, they do better. And they do better regardless of whether they experience you know, a variety of environments in adulthood. So the difficulty is that, for example, in the case of the Dutch hunger winter, where kids gestating during that time experience higher rates of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome later in life, 
what you actually have is the following information. You have individuals who are born in poor early environments. You have, for example, their siblings born in non-famine years. And you've measured how they do on some y-axis measure in a good environment in adulthood. So you're measuring these two points on these reaction norms. Um, those two points are not adequate to characterize the entire reaction norm. In fact, they'd be perfectly consistent with reaction norms that look like that and don't cross at all. So we think that what you actually need is to see individuals who are born in good environments and bad environments in good environments and bad environments. Right? We're not the only people who have pointed that out. Um, we think that Ambicelli offers a, a nice opportunity to do this because it actually is a, an ecologically highly variable environment. So here I'm showing you um, cumulative uh, rainfall across the hydrological year from um, the 70s up until 2011 when this graph stops. And you can see that some years we get four times the amount of rainfall as others. Um, to put this in context, when we have low rainfall, it looks kind of like the desert southwest. And uh, this is how much rainfall you guys get every year. It's, it's off this chart. Um, we never get as much rainfall as you guys did here. A couple millimeters of that fell on me today. Um, OK, so we have good years. We have bad years. And in particular, when Amanda wanted to start the, this project, we had just gone through a few years ago the worst drought that has ever been recorded in this ecosystem um, period. We had um, dead giraffes and dead elephants. And um, the baboons did OK, but it was a rough year. That was 2009. And the drought was exacerbated by the fact that the year before, 2008, was also among the driest years that we've ever recorded. It was a, it was a bad year. So what did that do um, to measures of fitness in our animals? Actually, survival was quite good in the baboons, especially compared to other large mammals in the ecosystem. But conceptions um, took a nosedive, nose so fertility um, uh, components, fertility-related components of fitness. So this is the same years. I'm plotting the same hydrological years on the x-axis here. And this is the proportional number of adult females who conceive an offspring in any of those years. So it kind of hovers around like 60 to 65 percent of females conceive in a given year. In 2009, that dropped um, to below 40 percent. We had very few babies that year. OK. So we have females who live through multiple of these years, of course. And that gives us the opportunity to ask, OK, for those females who lived in poor years, uh, through 2009 in particular, how did they do in terms of their probability of conception? We also looked at the probability that they resumed um, estrus cycling after postpartum amen amenorrhea. Um, for those individuals who were uh, reproductive adults in relatively benign years, sort of the average expectation for this ecosystem, how did they do? And did that differ for individuals who were born in poor early environments, in drought-like environments, versus those who were born in benign environments defined the same way. Okay, So in other words, the question is, how does the shift between a good year and a poor year within females affect their relative uh, reproductive performance? And does that differ between those who were exposed to a similar um, environment early in life, controlling for all the other stuff that we know affects um, conception probabilities and fertility in this population? So again, I'm going to jump straight to some results here. Um, so these are females born in low quality years on the left and females born in high quality years on the right. And these show the distribution across females in that category. So these are females born in low quality years during the 2009 drought and females born in high quality, uh, low quality years during uh, good years in adulthood. Higher on the y-axis is more likely to conceive. So um, overall, there was a main effect of drought. I already showed you that. There's about a 24% um, decrease in conception probability estimated by our model. But for those females who were born in droughts, that drop was actually more like 60%. Versus for females who were born in good years, that drop was about 10%. So that's about a six-fold difference in how hit they were by living through this terrible drought event in adulthood. Um, the results are very similar for estrus cycling, so resumption of cycling after postpartum amenorrhea. Baboon reproductive histories are pretty similar um, to humans in that way. And what that put, put together, what that tells us is that females who were born in bad conditions, rather than doing better when their adult conditions matched, actually did worse. And females who were born in relatively benign conditions actually seem to be better buffered against the um, effects of drought. Okay. So what we're really talking about here, just to make it clear, is this yellow arrow. How did this, sh this shift occur within individuals who might differ otherwise in intrinsic quality? Okay. Um, 
Amanda noticed some heterogeneity in the effects of the drought, and so she was interested in whether there were other components of the early life, as, as my earlier results suggested, that might explain um, that heterogeneity. And so what it looked like to us is that for those females who were born in a drought, who also lived through 2009 um, as reproductive adults, that those who were born to high-ranking females actually were relatively buffered against the effects of drought. Um, whereas those who were born to low-ranking females suffered the most. So this is like, in a sense, very not deep. Um, Amanda said, I think what I found out is that if females are born to low-ranking moms in really bad years, and then they live a, through a really, really bad year in adulthood, then it's very bad for them. And we said, yeah, I think that's right. I think that's what we found. However, that's not what was predicted, okay, by some fairly influential theory about um, uh, ad adaptive matching. Okay, so um, to go back to, to the models, I think what we're seeing is something that looks a lot more de like developmental constraints than predictive adaptive responses. Um, and these appear to be somewhat contingently experienced. In good years, we actually don't see any difference between females who are born in good versus bad years. So it seems to be exposed by um, subsequent exposure to drought. Um, and it's also contingent, we think, on aspects of the social environment so that even if females do um, get born, uh, are born in a dry year, um, and have to live through a dry year later on, if they were born to high-ranking mothers, we just, that, that effect really attenuates a lot. And in particular, our, our model um, predicts a 1.8% increase in conception probability per ranked position. That seems really small, but some of these groups um, contain 30 females. And so we're talking about differences at the extremes of the hierarchy um, that um, may really be meaningful to the lives of these organisms, especially since droughts, not as bad as 2009, but droughts in, in the pretty low range of rainfall actually do pop up about once a decade um, in our population. The likelihood that a female will see a drought like that in her lifetime, if she lives long enough, is pretty high. So uh, fitness-related effects on fertility, yes. We also think fitness-related effects crop up as a consequence of early life insults um, on lifetime reproductive success, and that's what I'm showing you here. Remember, females who get hit over and over again um, live much shorter lives than the, the females that we tend to call silver spoon babies. Um, and how long they live, how long baboons live, baboon females live anyway, is the, the biggest predictor of how many um, surviving offspring they'll leave behind. That's the relationship here. Basically, females are popping out another live offspring every 2.1 years. So attenuating your lifespan by 10 years is a, is a big deal. Okay, so where does that put us um, in terms of Amanda's question? So our data, at least um, these data, uh, tend to favor a developmental constraints model. Um, that squares with uh, results that have been coming out from other long-lived um, animals, roe deer, um, human populations. Um, there is support for some you know, adaptive programming type phenomena, but they tend to be concentrated in species that are relatively shorter lived. And so these differences in life history, which also relate to how much your early life can actually predict what's going to happen to you you know, down the road um, may make a big difference on the, the possibility that effects like this versus effects like this evolve. Okay, so um, I've, t I've alluded several times to the idea that social interactions, whether um, competitive or affiliati affiliative, have strong predictive effects on fitness-related or health-related outcomes. And um, it's very easy, and I probably have done it already, to slip into the language that suggests that that's a direct causal relationship, what, um, what my social science colleagues would call social causation. But um, especially when I gave you examples in humans, it's probably very easy for you to come up with other explanations for a strong predictive association. Um, one is obviously that social interactions define a lot of other aspects of how we and other animals live. And so um, there may be mediation-related pathways that involve uh, health risk behaviors, like smoking, for instance, or diet, um, or alcoholism. And there may also be institutional or societal uh, correlates, like access to health care. Um, it's also completely possible that some of the phenomena we're seeing are reverse, are, are reverse causal with respect to that initial model. Um, if you are less healthy, if you're more sick, uh, competing for dominance or establishing strong social relationships may in fact simply be harder to do. Um, again, uh, we will never have the sort of data in the primates that I study that um, my colleagues who study humans uh, have access to, but we do have an ability 
to rule out at least some of the most common health habit related and healthcare access related explanations um, that are, are pertinent to our own species in systems like the baboons, simply because they don't smoke and they don't drink and they don't have health care, right? Um, it's very hard for us to rule out reverse causal pathways uh, because we can't do an experiment on them. That is why um, my lab also divides some of its time to focus on rhesus macaques in captivity, where it's more um, uh, feasible to do manipulations of the social environment. And um, with the, out the outcomes I'm going to focus on today are all focused on um, uh, gene regulation, specifically in, in uh, immune-related uh, cell types. Okay, why would we even think that social uh, relationships were important to gene regulation? And this comes out of work that I did with my postdoc advisor, uh, Yoav Galad, when I was at Chicago, um, where we showed that differences in dominance rank in female rhesus macaques, also a highly hierarchical society with, with linear social status um, uh, relationships, uh, were pretty strongly associated with levels of gene expression in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So those are the cells in our body, our lymphocytes and our monocytes. They include your T cells and B cells, for example, your natural killer cells and so on. Okay, so um, we were interested in understanding uh, more about this relationship, specifically whether we actually had our finger on a causal relationship between sociality and gene regulation and um, also what this might mean to, to the organism. So this is work that was led by my postdoc Noah, who some of you guys know very well, and um, my colleague Luis Barrero's um, postdoc Joaquin Sanz. So this is the setup. This is why we think we can get at questions of causality um, in this system. It turns out that if you take adult female rhesus macaques and you create new social groups, you socially house them together, that the order in which they're introduced into those groups is the primary predictor of where they will pop up in the rank hierarchy. So specifically, those who go in first become high ranking, and those that go in second tend to become the second highest ranking, and then down, down the line. So this is the sort of experiment we could um, never do in our own species. So we could never just randomize um, a group of humans into different levels of, for example, income or education. So we can form these new social groups. We use five member social groups. And then we replicate that across multiple, uh, multiple groups. So in this case, I'm going to talk about data that involves nine replicate social groups, 45 total individuals. So um, we argued that to establish causality, however, you have to be able to not only um, show that something happens when you make these groups, but then when you perturb them, show that your expected you know, consequence also occurs um, after that perturbation. And so what we did in the middle of the study was take out all the alpha females, all the top ranking females, and put them together in a group with controlled introductions, and then do the same thing with all the second ranking females, third ranking females, fourth ranking females, and fifth ranking females. So now you have a new social group that's composed entirely of females who are the top in their groups in the first phase of the study. These are rhesus macaques. They are, um, they are highly hierarchical. They're what primatologists consider despotic. And so it takes you know, not very long, and you get new social dominance rank hierarchies. This design maximizes all possible um, changes in dominance rank between the first and second phase of the study. This um, takes kind of years to do. And so we followed these animals for about a year, did this rearrangement, and then followed them for another year um, up until mi the middle of 2015. OK, this is just to give you an idea of how this, this works. So each line is a different individual. This is, uh, I think, in phase one of our study. In this particular graph, low-ranking individuals um, are on the bottom, high-ranking on the top. This is a continuous measure of dominance rank um, based on ELO ratings. And so this is what happens to them as they're sequentially introduced. It doesn't take very long. You get a nice dominance rank hierarchy, and it is very, very stable. OK, so we monitored the behavior of each of these animals in both of those phases. Um, this is what dominance ranks looks like between phase one and phase two. So every dot is a female, and they're switching from um, high rank to low rank or, or not, depending on how they were reorganized into those groups. And of course, there is no correlation between a female's dominance rank in phase one and a female's dominance rank in phase two. That's exactly what, what we want to see. Um, for those of you who are interested in 
um, behavior and the behavioral correlates of social status, uh, you change their dominance rank and a whole other lot of things change along with it, including their engagement in affiliative behavior and also, you know, sort of first principle components of behavior that people label things like, you know, sociability and boldness and so on, largely driven just by dominance rank in, in, our, in our studies. Okay. So at the same time, we were doing, um, uh, we were collecting biological samples to ask what was going on with the function of their immune system. Um, one of the real limitations of the study that um, uh, we published in 2012 or so was that we were looking at this composite set of cells, you know, these PBMCs that contain cells that function in adaptive immunity and cells that function in innate immunity, and they were all just kind of jumbled together. We measured their relative proportions, but that's still not quite as clean as actually looking at individual cell types. So when we purified the cells from these animals, we actually physically separated them using flow cytometry into the five major, uh, the five major types of, of cells that you can find in a PBMC pool, so monocytes and natural killer cells, which have primary functions in innate immunity, helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and B cells, which have primary functions in adaptive immunity. This allows us to start getting at questions of what exactly social status is, is doing. What functions is it, is it influencing? Is it just sort of broad spectrum, or does it seem to be fairly specific? And then we also wanted to know whether this made a difference in, you know, as close to um, a model of infection that we were willing to, to do. So, um, you know, differences in gene expression, great. We're, we all have differences in gene expression, like right now in this room, and that doesn't necessarily, um, it may mean something, but it, it, it may not. And so we wanted to know what happened when we actually confronted the cells of these animals with, uh, with what looked to them, looked those cells, like bacterial infection. So to do that, we drew blood from each animal into a tube that contained a cell culture media and a tube that contained cell culture media sp spiked with uh, a compound called lipopolysaccharide, which is a component of gram-negative um, bacterial cell walls and stimulates a very strong immune response. Um, we took these tubes and we stuck them at an, in an incubator at you know, body temperature, 37 degrees, and um, cultured them in parallel for each individual for about four hours, and then harvested the white blood cell fractions from each of the samples. All of this stuff kind of ultimately gets piped into um, uh, RNA-seq libraries and then sequenced on, on an Illumina. So here are the results, or some of the results, from our cell type specific analysis. So each dot is an RNA-seq library for 45 females. This is 440 RNA-seq samples. And the PCA that I'm showing you here is, is being run on about um, 8,600 genes or so. This is not very deep. What it's showing you, this is, this is actually, you know, this was quality control for us, is that if you separate different cell types, their gene expression profiles also separate them. This is what you should expect. Monocytes are doing different things in, in the body um, than natural killer cells. And so we see those discrete cell populations separate from each other. These two are um, cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells, so the ones that are, are most closely related to each other in hematopoietic differentiation. Okay, so for each of these cell types, we then asked, well, is there effect of dominance rank on gene expression? Um, oh, sorry, I should say we were glad we did this because actually there are differences in cell type proportions that differentiate high-ranking and low-ranking individuals too. So if you see differences in gene expression in a pool and you don't separate these kinds of things or you don't at least control for them, then it's very hard to differentiate whether you actually have differences in gene regulation within cells or whether you just have different representation of the types of cells in the sample. Okay. So um, each of these plots is showing the results of about 9,000 genes worth of tests for dominance rank effects on gene expression. So these are distributions of p-values. And the black line in each case is the null distribution um, based on um, empirical permutation of our data. So what we're looking for here is are cases in which there are many, many more um, genes that show low p-values, sort of an enrichment over the left-hand side of the distribution, than expected under the null. And we don't see that, for example, in this plot, the, that's the test on monocytes. We do see it in two cases, in particular, the natural killer cells in purple and the helper T cells in red. Okay, so what this is suggesting to us is that dominance rank has fairly cell-type specific effects 
on gene expression, particularly in these two cell types. Um, th there's, there's, you know, we have to be cautious with these kinds of um, analyses because we're using false discovery rate approaches where the power to detect effects depends on the whole distribution and where you know, we don't want to say, oh, you have a really cell type specific effect, but what you actually have is the equivalent of a, you know, a nominal p-value of 0.06 in one cell type and 0.04 in the other cell type. Those are not actually different from one another, right? Um, so to address this problem, we actually did a meta-analysis of our results across cell types, and that actually um, supported our, our initial assumptions. So in each of these cases, you just look vertically. This is a possible configuration of cell type specific effects. So this first column is a case where only NK cells, natural killer cells, are affected. The second column, NK and helper T cells. And so there are 32 possible configurations across the five cell types we were looking at. And this is the number of rank responsive genes that were um, most closely associated with this particular configuration. And again, the most dominant pattern was in NK cells. This was really actually quite surprising to us because if you apply the exact same method to genetic effects on gene expression, so-called expression quantitative trait loci, um, you actually get very few effects that are cell type specific, about 6%, for example, in one data analysis, um, whereas we're getting, you know, close to a quarter of our genes that have cell type specific effects um, in actually cell types that are much more closely related to one another. Okay, so um, one natural question is like, where is this coming from? You know, social status is sort of a, a summary statistic for, um, for the behavior of these organisms and the environments they experience. So one possibility is that the differences in gene expression that we're observing are differences that stem from the fact that low-ranking individuals are more regularly subjected to harassment from higher-ranking animals. And that's actually what you can see here, phase one data and phase two data in the two different colors. These are high-ranking animals and these are low-ranking animals. Sorry, I've switched the axes directions sometimes. And low-ranking animals, uh, sorry, low-ranking animals receive higher rates of harassment. It's part of being low ranking in a macaque society. But it turns out that low ranking e animals also engage in less affiliative behavior. They're grooming less with the group mates than high ranking individuals. And, and that could be important to the results that we're observing as well. So in other words, if you sort of draw out the pathways, we have this effect of dominance rank on gene expression. It could be mediated by you know, agonistic competitive harassment behavior. It could be mediated by affiliative behavior. Um, Okay, so to ask that question, we took those genes that were rank responsive, so we have some sort of relationship between dominant rank and gene expression, and then um, we asked, well, if you took into account grooming rates, for example, did that relationship, does that slope attenuate? Right? Is there now a less of a close relationship between rank and gene expression? So if we have an effect size of beta for rank on expression, we're, we're asking when we um, incorporate grooming behavior, does that go closer to zero? Right. And we can ask the same question for um, agonistic behavior and ask whether the effect attenuates towards zero. So um, all of those little drawings of lines and lollipops, that's what I'm showing you here. But here I'm showing it to you for every rank responsive gene um, in the genome for helper T cells and natural killer cells are most responsive cell types. Okay, and, and you know, it's maybe easier to look at it this way. This is just a summary of the percent of rank responsive genes that are affected by, that are mediated, that have mediating effect by grooming behavior in green, um, har received harassment in this sort of, um, I don't know, tannish color or both in orange. And um, what was really striking to us is that, at least in the natural killer cells where we have the most resolution, uh, affiliative behavior actually mediated three times as many genes as harassment behavior. And normally, when we talk about social status, we really are thinking about, you know, harassment behavior, competitive behavior. So um, uh, I probably wouldn't say this on my own, but we had a reviewer say this, so, so, so it wasn't me. And, um, and he or she wrote, well, gosh, so they're asking how social status gets under the skin. It seems like what we're seeing is a complex mixture of positive and negative valence behaviors with an absence of love having more effect than harassment, which is an interesting idea. Okay, so um, one question, of course, is how reversible is this? So you're walking around with a molecular signature of being low rank or high rank. Now um, fortune smiles on you and you are the new high ranking 
female in phase two of our study, does that change that molecular signature? And it appears to do so actually relatively rapidly. Here I'm showing you natural killer cell data and helper T cell data. Um, and each dot here is a rank responsive gene. Um, so this is a gene's eye view. And these effects are positively correlated across rank one, uh, sorry, phase one of our study, pre-rearrangement, and phase two of our study, post-rearrangement, even though the individuals who are actually occupying high and low rank are totally uncorrelated with one another. Um, this is easier for me to look at. This is an individual's eye view instead of a gene's eye view. So now every dot is an individual repeated in the different colors. Um, some of them went up in rank after this rearrangement, and some of them went down in rank after this rearrangement. For those genes that are more highly expressed with high rank, their gene expression went up. If they increased rank for those genes where high expression is associated with low rank, their gene expression went down if they increased rank. So this is just the sort of um, you know, intersection graph that you'd expect if, in fact, this is a fairly plastic phenotype that's responsive to the current environment without a strong um, marker of social history. Okay, so this is the, uh, these are the LPS data results. I'm just transitioning a little bit here. Again, um, as before, every dot here are the results of a single RNA-seq uh, um, library. And every, each female is represented twice in this plot. Once in the control condition, where her cells are just kind of hanging out in an incubator for four hours, and once in an LPS-stimulated condition, where her cells are hanging out with what looks like a major pathogen attack. OK, so that's in green. Um, unsurprisingly, this is basically what you see if you ever throw pathogens or things that look like pathogens at cells. The first principal component of gene expression variation separates these conditions. Okay, so there's a major response to a bacterial, uh, simulated bacterial infection in cell types like these. What was quite striking to us, though, is the, the, the depth of color in both the green and the blue. That's encoding dominance rank, where the darker colors are higher ranking individuals and the lighter colors are lower ranking individuals. And that explains the second principal component of um, gene expression in this data set. So there's a very strong signature of dominance rank again. OK, so we're back to a gene's eye view. Each dot here is a gene that we measured. And what I'm plotting here is the effect of dominance rank on gene expression in the control samples, the, the, the nothing happening to these cell samples, versus the effect of dominance rank for the same gene um, in the LPS condition, in the infection condition. And as expected, these are positively correlated. Okay, So if a gene is more highly expressed in high-ranking individuals, it tends to be um, uh, more highly expressed in high-ranking individuals, whether or not the animal's cells are being exposed to LPS. There's a little bit of a, of a patterned exception to this rule, though, and that's um, this set of genes down here. Okay? These are genes where we're observing interaction effects between dominance rank and the response to infection. And specifically, these are genes in which, in the infection condition, there's a larger effect of dominance rank than there was in the control condition, and that is directional in the sense that there's a larger effect of, of infection on low-ranking individuals than there is on high-ranking individuals. You can see that in this graph here. So this is the absolute effect of uh, the LPS stimulation for high-ranking individuals and low-ranking individuals. Low-ranking individuals are responding more, is, is basically what that means. And um, if you go back and look at that PCA, you can actually kind of see that even in the global data. This is the separation for low-ranking individuals between the null and the stimulated condition. And this is the separation for high-ranking individuals. So there's a, you know, kind of a bigger distance to travel in PC space. OK. So we can try and break that down further. We can look at genes that are upregulated by infection and genes that are downregulated by infection. And we can look at those genes that are more highly expressed in high-ranking individuals here in the right-hand column or genes that are more highly expressed in low-ranking individuals, lower expression, high-ranking individuals on the left-hand side. This is, um, uh, this is a genomic study, so we can find examples of all of these things, right? So I can tell you there, there's hundreds of all of them. Um, and so we, we, we did a, um, a categorical enrichment analysis. For those of you who work with genomic data, this is sort of a typical way to try and ask whether there are sort of coherent um, pathways or processes that fall in like, for example, one of these categories, right? Like, are these all genes involved in, I don't know, cell motility? That would be weird, but you know, okay, could, could happen. And, and for those of you who work with genomic data, you also know that most of the time this doesn't tell you very much. You get some categories, and you're like, oh, I've got some categories.
categories. So this was actually the most satisfying categorical enrichment analysis we ever did. Um, those two bottom categories just fell out completely. They weren't enriched for anything in particular. They don't look particularly coherent. But both of these top categories were. So I'm just going to call these low rank genes and these high rank genes to stop having to say genes that were more highly regulated in high ranking individuals and blah, blah, blah. Um, these genes on the left hand side were highly enriched for immune system processes, unsurprisingly, and particularly those that were associated with inflammation. The ones on the right hand side were specifically enriched for also immune system processes, but immune system processes that are regulated by type 1 interferon. Well, that was remarkable to us. And the reason it was remarkable to us is because what we had done as a stimulation experiment was dose with lipopolysaccharide. Well, we know what the cellular receptor for lipopolysaccharide is. It's toll-like receptor 4. And this is the downstream pathway for LPS toll-like receptor 4 interactions. And um, that pathway can, uh, that, that response can be roughly divided into two molecular pathways. The left-hand side, which is um, dependent on an adapter called MyD88, which flows through a bunch of stuff and ends up in a regulatory program that's largely mediated by the transcription factor NF-kappa kappa D. Um, then there's this right-hand side pathway, which is dependent on an adapter called TRIF, which lands at um, a, a regulatory cascade mediated by interferon regulatory factors. So what we're getting in those two categories, we think, is, um, is a polarization in low-ranking individuals towards this NF-kappa B mediated pathway and high-ranking individuals towards um, an interferon response pathway. And there are many genes within both of these pathways that are either more highly expressed in low-ranking or more highly expressed in high-ranking individuals, including these transcription factors themselves. Okay? So um, we decided we could dig into that a little bit more by asking about potential transcription factor binding events near those low rank or high rank genes. Um, and we decided to do this by looking at chromatin accessibility in our samples. So as we, um, you know, as, I, as I, was, I was reminded, if you stretch, you know, every, uh, every total amount of, you know, DNA into linear space, like we get this intro bio right, and we lay it end to end, then it's like six feet tall, which is considerably taller than me. So how do we fit all that DNA into all of our cells to pack them really tightly? Well, we wrap um, our, our DNA into, into chromatin. We wrap them around um, nucleosomes, around histone proteins, and we pack them really, really tightly. <laughs> and where DNA is packed very, very tightly, it tends to be less accessible to regulation by, by protein binding, for example, by transcription factors. Where it's more open, more it's, where, where it's more accessible, those factors can bind. And um, in the past few years, the, uh, there's the, um, a very, very efficient, easy protocol for profiling genome-wide chromatin accessibility, um, ATAC-seq, um, from Will Greenleaf's lab, uh, that makes it really easy to figure out where exactly chromatin is, is closed and where it's open. What's nice about that is then we can look at the sequence underlying those open regions and, you know, boy, wouldn't it be really nice if those, those sequences actually turn out to correspond to the transcription factor binding motifs for the transcription factors we were interested in. And um, it turns out it does. So we profiled um, chromatin accessibility in some of our samples, and we asked about uh, what transcription factor binding sites were, were enriched, tended to be close to those low rank genes. Um, again, these are those guys where we think they're using the NF kappa B response pathway much more. And it turns out that the only two transcription factor binding site motifs that were enriched are two that are, that are basically NF-kappa B binding sites. Um, nothing for, for interferon regulatory factors for these low rank genes. But if we looked at transcription factor binding sites in open chromatin near high ranking genes, it completely reverses and the enrichment is specifically for binding sites for interferon regulatory factors and not for NF-kappa B. Um, finally, uh, you know, we, we drew from data in the literature from knockout mice. So there are mice that have knockouts for TRIF and knockouts for MyD88. So you can identify genes where gene expression is specifically dependent on the presence of those molecules. So if you take a, a, a TRIF knockout mouse, and then we didn't do this, um, uh, we used data that uh, others had generated, and you challenge it with a bunch of stuff, you can identify things dependent on it. And it turns out those genes that are TRIF dependent are enriched specifically for genes that are more highly expressed in high-ranking individuals, as we would predict. And if we look at uh, genes that are MyD88 dependent, 
it's the opposite. We get this enrichment specifically in genes that are more highly expressed in low-ranking individuals, those low-ranking genes, and we actually get significant under-enrichment for high-ranking genes. So what does this mean? Well, a lot of interferon regulatory um, factor activity has to do with uh, innate responses to virus as opposed to NF-kappa B, um, which is a highly, you know, generates this pro-inflammatory program. Um, more tailored to bacterial defense. So it looks like we're getting polarization of usage of these pathways that might, we didn't test this directly, affect the relative ability of high and low ranking individuals to cope with different types of pathogens in their environment, which is something that um, we're hoping to test shortly. Okay. So just to sum up, um, what we're doing here is asking about uh, environmental effects, really, and a lot of environmental effects that are shaped by social interactions with conspecifics, you know, what's going to make your day good or make your day not so good. And um, in the baboons, what we're able to show is that the, the profound effects of social relationships on mortality, which have been described for decades in humans, are something that has fairly deep roots in our evolutionary lineage. Um, even if there is no uh, variance in healthcare access, and even if there is no smoking and so on. Okay, so this, this is a, a, a really uh, interesting phenomenon to us that we're trying to understand further. Um, in the macaques, we can get a little bit deeper into mechanism. And so we, I didn't talk about this stuff in much detail, but it's clear that low-ranking animals, they get harassed more, they are performing affiliative behaviors less, they have poor glucocorticoid um, feedback, um, they have changes in the actual cells that are circulating in their bloodstream. And then if we dig in further to the, you know, subcellular level, um, what that translates to is changes in the regulatory program for some of the major cell types that are important in immune defense, changes in their response to infection, and potentially even within that response, polarization of different pathways um, uh, in, in uh, downstream. Okay. So with that, um, I'll just wrap up by, by thanking, this work involved a lot of people, um, folks in my lab, particularly Noah, who is a real leader on um, the macaque work, and Amanda, who was responsible for um, the developmental constraints predictive adaptive response stuff. Um, Luis Barrera and Mark Wilson in particular are my collaborators on the macaque work, and, and Susan Alberts, Gene Altman, and Beth Archie for everything baboon related. And if there's time, um, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah. Kind of distinction. And I, so it made me wonder to what extent we might, um, the, the, where the mediator of this effect might be the uh, removal of activity in human behavior. So I wonder if you could test that by just, and it'd be pretty easy to test, right? Just sort of remove the ectoparasites in one form. So these are captive animals, and they don't really have ectoparasites. I don't want to say no ectoparasites, but the visible ones that we can see on wild animals they're not exposed to it. They actually have really good health care, which is universal across dominance ranks. So what you're thinking in terms of, I mean, there's a lot of classical testing that's parallel with that classical polarization. W what do you think is mediating that? Is it, is it, the, is it waves of love? <laughs> that's what our reviewer said. <laughs> but we didn't put that in the paper. What do you think is, is, is driving that? Um, right. So another way to ask that question um, is, how do these cells, which are immune cells in the bloodstream, how do they know that they're high or low ranking, right? Like, what's telling them that? What's the upstream sort of stuff? Um, I think that uh, HPA access regulation is an obvious candidate, glucocorticoid regulation. So I, I sort of mentioned very quickly that we see differences in glucocorticoid um, physiology in high and low ranking individuals. And glucocorticoids are a powerful negative regulator of inflammation. So that seems like one obvious place to look at, and we are looking at that. Um, others have argued that um, much of the, the differences that you might see in association with stress or social stress-related um, gene regulation may be mediated by beta-adrenergic beta signaling, which is another place um, where we haven't looked very carefully, but may be important here. Um, interestingly, uh, after we published this, someone told me on Twitter that this sort of um, polarization effect that we saw between the sort of MIDI-80 and trif dependent pathways and the LPS response was actually something um, that had also been uh, sort of reported, and was a, the analysis was a little bit different, in um, 
in Hutterites and Amish, so two sort of traditionally living agricultural populations, um, the, the, the Hutterites have really, really elevated levels of asthma in children relative to the Amish. And they also sort of um, differentially regulate these two pathways in response to, to LPS. So there they're arguing it is exposure, not to ectoparasites specifically, but to other stuff that activates the immune system in the environment. Maybe. I mean, it's not really clear to me that that is going to be but parallel here because, like, it's not like high ranking animals live in a much cleaner enclosure than low ranking. They're living in the same enclosure. Um, so I, I guess I just bring that up because. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Yes. 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 I'm going to say yes because it. It smells like a trade-off, but we don't have data that shows you that it's a specific trade-off, and I don't think other people have done it that way either. Yes? Uh, you know, it's the uh, social ranking that is preventing gene expression, not the other way around. Oh, because we, we manipulated social rank, and we didn't manipulate gene expression. So the fact that we can randomize and then re-randomize the same individuals. But, but how do you know when you are, so when you say you manipulate ranking, yeah. you mean which way you put in first, right? Yep. Because we pick who we put in first right. and who we put in second and so on. Yes, yes. Then we, then we measure social rank afterwards. And that's how we can also show that they're uncorrelated between phases. Yeah, but you see, you see a correlation between expression change and rank, right? I see that when we change dominance rank, and the only thing we're directly manipulating is dominance rank, we see responses in gene expression. So why does the dominance rank change? Because we make it change. That's right. Second, yep. You actually don't know what exactly is causing the rank change. Right. So, okay. So, so I guess you could uh, are you making the argument that if you if, if you that what we're actually first, doing is affecting their gene expression by putting them in first and second? Could be. Yeah. Well, I th I mean, I I guess you could say that it's it's something that has actually nothing to do with their social interactions, but I would find that really implausible. Um, we are, you know, something important has to happen to these animals. And the thing that we're directly manipulating is, is dominance Water. rank via, via, do it's, it's the same thing by like, as saying, like, if you're ma manipulating uh, social isolation, you know, like, you can put uh, an animal in solitary housing and you can have it in group housing. And we're pretty sure it's the solit it's being solitary, being group housed that matters. So I think your argument would be parallel to, no, it's just putting them in a, in a box. Or not putting, I'm thinking about mice, that's why they're in boxes, sorry. Um, uh, but that's, that's just so much less plausible why, than changing what they're actually experiencing. That's a great question. We have no idea why. It has nothing to do with how dominance rank is inherited in so female macaques in general. That would be really amazing if we randomized order of introduction and, and happened to hit on it twice in the same, and remember, we're watching the same animals when they're high ranking and when they're low ranking, right? And so that secondary manipulation we think is really, really crucial. Yeah, Do you see what I mean? I, I like, mean, but, if, but if it was just something, something intrinsic just about the animal? You're, you're saying something is affecting the ranking, mm -hmm. and then the ranking is affecting expression, right? That's what you're saying. Ye Something determines the rank, well, yes. Sure, so I think what's missing here is to have independent data about right. the dominance, behavioral data, as well as gene expression. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an unambiguous ranking. Yep, that's very clear. It's hugely manipulated. Like yeah, yeah, I know. I think it's pretty stressful to them, honestly, because they're not living with kin, and that's really unusual for a female rhesus macaque. I mean, we can continue talking about this, but I, I am actually quite sure about, about that aspect of the study design. Yeah, Jacinta? So in the, in the approach to the entire setup, it yep. was rank. It was rank, and then you know, determining and measuring the, the adjunct effects. But yep. the bigger effect is the data. Yeah. So now I want to take that data, and I want to apply it to the idea that social, the more social animals tend to be the ones that are higher fitness. 
Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not dominant. It's actually so in in the wild we find that dominance rank among females generally has a has somewhat of an effect, yeah. but not so much. Yeah. Like it's a little less. It's on on survival. Yeah. Focus yep. on these really yep. extreme environments. Yep. It generally doesn't have a yep. huge effect. Maybe it's because it's not ranked. It's actually the grooming. Yeah. Because you get a lot of grooming yeah. in low ranking females. Yeah. And 